You are listening to WTUZ Radio Podcast. Welcome to WTUZ Radio Podcast. I am your host, Rhonda. Uh, Today's topic, we are doing part three of our series, O World Tech, Hidden in Plain Sight. Uh, So if this is your first time catching this series, I highly recommend uh, you go back and check out the other episodes. The last episode We got into uh, the old world buildings and the associated technology with those buildings um, and how those buildings stand today. And we talked about uh, the electricity current wars uh, as well between uh, Edison, Westinghouse, uh, and Tesla. Uh, So I encourage you to go back to the first two episodes. Uh, The purpose of this is to just show you all that the technology that they are bringing forth today is not new. This technology has been around for a long time. They are only just reintroducing it. So today uh, we are going to talk about gravity. Okay, so... Uh, folks that um, they want to call flat earthers, which has become a dirty name, uh, you know, along with put the conspiracy theorists up there, blah, 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 whatever the case may be. This is always a huge topic uh, when folks talk about that there isn't gravity. Um, people associate that with the flat earth movement. And uh, we're going to take a different spin on it. We're going to use it based on uh, levitation. Okay. So with that said, let's get into it. Let me uh, make sure we get into it. Okay. So again, I... uh, encourage you all and I'm going to put the link the link to this site in the description. Excellent job by this gentleman, uh, Jim. Uh, it's called teslaresearch.jimdofree.com. I think he did an absolutely um, excellent body of work. We're using this as the main source for this series. Uh, we went over the current wars. We went over a Niagara Falls project. Um, we went over the death ray, which is really tied to uh, what they call now is the do uh, direct energy weapon. Uh, we went over Tesla's turbine, oscillators, Tesla coils. Um, so today we're going to talk about the dynamic theory of gravity, all right? Okay, so again, shout out to Jim Dufree. Excellent, excellent body of work you put here. Uh, I love how you put it together. And for all of you tech heads that are really into building prototypes or whatever, he literally put the specifications, the details in here, uh, links to other sources. So I think he did an uh, absolutely fabulous job. I will put the link in the description of the video so uh, you all can get to it easily for yourself. Okay, so the dynamic theory of gravity. When Tesla was 82, instead of speaking at a dinner party, he issued a written statement. I have worked out a dynamic theory of gravity in all details and hope to give this to the world very soon. It explains explains the cause of this force and the motions of heavenly bodies under its influence so satisfactory that it will put an end to the idle speculations and false concept as that of curved space. According to the relativists, space has a tendency to curvature owing 
um, owing to an inherent property or presence of celestial bodies. Grant, granting a semblance of reality to this fantastic idea, it is still very self-contradictory. Mm -hmm. I know comment. <laughs> Every action is accompanied by an equivalent reaction and the effects of the latter are directly opposite to those of the former. Supposing that the bodies act upon the surrounding space causing curvature of the same, it appears to my simple mind that the curved spaces must react on the bodies and producing the opposite effect, straightened out the curves. Mm. Mm -hmm. Since action and reaction are coexistent, it follows that the supposed curvature of space is entirely impossible. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I'm just in the con. I'm just, you know, for folks they're calling flat earthers, I'm back in the church section with my fan for you. Mm -hmm. However, even if it existed, it would not explain the motions of the bodies as observed. Only the existence of a field of force can account for them and its assumptions. Its assumption dispenses with space curvature. All literature on this subject is futile and destined to ob oblivion. Mm -hmm. Another prepared statement on his 81st birthday in July 10th, 1937, critiquing Einstein's theory of relativity. Supposing that the bodies act upon the surrounding space causing curving of the same, it appears to my simple mind that the curved spaces must react on the bodies and producing the opposite effect, straightening out the curve. Since action and reaction are coexistent, it follows that the supposed curvature of space is entirely impossible, uh, but even if it existed, it would not explain the motions of the bodies as exerb. Only the existence of a field of force can account for the motions of the body as observed, and its assumption dispenses with space curvature. All literature on this subject is futile and destined to oblivion. So are all attempts to explain the workings of the universe without recognizing the existing of the ether and the indispensable function it plays in the phenomena. Mm -hmm. So in other words, Tesla is saying that he's questioning this notion of curvature. He's questioning that. Okay. And he's saying that even if it does exist, It would have to be straightened out when you have two objects reacting to each other or magnetism. Mm. Now, I am going to, okay, let, let's just do this. Let's just do this and then we'll get into, um, another gravity thingy because I do want to show you all something and I'm going to have to pull that video. I forgot about that video, but I'm going to pull it. But let me read this and then we're going to talk about gravity a little bit more. New York Herald Times, uh, Pi Pioneer Radio Engineer gives views on power. New York Herald Times, I'm sorry, New York Herald Tribune in uh, 11, oh child, what? They, mm, mm in September 1932. I hold that space cannot be curved for the simple reason that it can have no properties. It might as well be said that God has properties. He has not, but only att attributes 
and there are, I'm sorry, and these are of our own making. Of properties, we can only speak when dealing with the matter filling the space. To say that in the presence of large bodies, space become curved is equivalent to stating that something can act upon nothing. Hmm. I, for one, refuse to subscribe such a view. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm going to pull the video. I'm going to pause, pull that video. We're going to be right back. All right, let's get to it. Um, I actually found, I forgot it was two vids that I wanted to show you all. Now, this is in regards to gravity, you know, how they teach gravity in school. Mm -hmm. It's not making too much sense. Okay. Uh, what about density? Okay. So this is the uh, YouTube channel, Dave Hawk. Um, and that's pretty good. It got 4 million views on this. So let's give it a shake and uh, see what. Dave. Today, I'm going to show you a simple science experiment that you can try at home to learn about density. Start by taking an empty glass and tip in some water and food colouring. Then add some syrup or treacle. And I'm going to add a little bit more water to make the layer a bit thicker. Then finally, fill the glass up with some oil and leave it to settle for about 15 minutes. These liquids separate out into different layers because they're different densities and they don't mix. The syrup has the highest density, so it sits on the bottom, and the oil, which has the lowest density, rises to the top. Try dropping different objects in to see what happens. If we drop this metal nut in, which is really dense, you can see it sinks right to the bottom. But if I take this grape and drop it in, it sinks through the oil and water, but sits on the syrup. This is because the syrup is denser than the grape. Pretty cool, huh? Now if I take this plastic bottle top and drop it in, it slowly sinks through the oil and sits on the water. And finally, if I take this piece of sponge and drop it in, it sits on top. The oil is denser than the sponge. You can try dropping different objects in to see which fluids are denser. I also found shining a torch beam down from above gives a really nice effect. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. If you want to see more, you can click on the links on the right hand side or take a look at my YouTube channel page. Okay, so uh, thanks again to uh, the Dave Hoth, Hoth, uh YouTube channel. Denser than you think science experiment. Uh, and that's good that it got 4 million views. Okay, so let's, this is another one. So just in case, you know, folk want to say, oh, but you know, he added syrup up in there. He added, um, uh, what was it, cooking oil, some type of oil in there. Okay, but I thought they taught you in school that if you drop two objects, they going to hit the ground the same. Okay, all right, well, whatever. Let's go to uh, this one. Uh, this is off of BBC earth labs um <clears throat> okay so what she's gonna be describing and um i'm gonna just block out because uh i don't know what music she's blocking out what she's gonna describe she's gonna do a density test on how temperature affect lab um this is how does temperature affect the density of water live experiment uh, this would be a great experiment for the babies, this one, as well as uh, this one. Because this one is really cool, too, to really, really show you density. And that's cool to see how these things sit on top of the different densities. Um, that's very, very cool. So that's that's great to experiment to have with the baby. So this one again is Dave Hawk, denser than you think science experiment. And then the other one is from BBC Earth Lab. 
how does temperature affect the density of water, okay? And I wanted to bring that on because when we're having the conversation about what really is gravity, you have to bring density into play, all right? Um, but Tesla and um, others are talking about this idea of things being curved, um, space, space being curved naturally it's not possible because if nothing is there wouldn't it need something around it to react it's basically what they're saying okay um all right so uh we know Nicole, nikola tesla's life spanned two scientific periods that of the 19th century, which saw the universe as filled with an invisible matter, the ether. And that of the 20th century, which saw the universe as an empty vacuum with bits of matter in random motion. Okay, so you see the difference, how that changed? Tesla was talking about the ether electromagnetism as an example of the difference between these two world views when the idea of electron was proposed at the end of the 1800s it was then pictured as a spinning vortex of this ether that condensed into solid matter uh so this was by nikola tesla a quote from uh, New York, America in the 1930s, the primary substance thrown into infant, infinitesimal worlds of prodigious velocity becomes gross matter. The force subsiding, the motion ceases, and matter disappears, reverting to primary substance. Another quote, on uh, by Tesla in 1908, according to an adopted theory, every pondering atom is differentiated from a tenuous, fragile, vague fluid, filling all space merely by spinning motion, as a whirl of water in a calm lake. By being set in a motion of fluid, the ether becomes gross matter. Its movement arrested or halted, the primary substance reverts to its normal state. It appears then possible for man through harness energy of the medium and suitable agencies for starting and stopping ether worlds to cause matter to form and disappear. At his command, almost without effort on his part, old worlds vanish and new ones would spring into being. He could alter the size of this planet, control its seasons, adjust its distance from the sun, guide it on its eternal journey along any path he might choose through the depths of the universe. He could make planets collide and produce his suns and stars, his heat and light. He could originate life in its own infinite forms. To cause at will the birth and uh, death of matter would be man's greatest deed, which would give him the mystery of physical creation, make him fulfill his ultimate destiny. He kind of, he said a lot there. He said a lot. So pretty much he's saying, if man learns to control the ether, He can control everything. We've already gone into um, adjusting the seasons, control its seasons. Um, weather machines. I paused <laughs> for a purpose. Weather machines. Adjust its distance from the sun, 
Hmm. If you've rocked with us when we went over what really is the concept of the black sun, which is really just an electromagnetic coil and the reflect the refraction light from those electromagnetic waves create the sun. Hmm. He could make planets collide. Okay, and planets, we already talked about that. It's not what they're saying they are. They're really just energy centers. Okay. Or reflections or refracted light of energy centers. Collide and produces suns and stars. Okay, so we talked about what the stars really are. And we talked about that the whole concept of what they're calling the universe is so far from what they are telling you because it is really an enclosed system, i.e. with the dome and the sun and what they're calling the moon are really reflect uh, reflections of refracted light controlled by an electromagnetic coil that obviously rotates. So he said pretty much a lot when he said that if you can control the ethers, you can control everything. So hence, my take on what true colonization really was, the first colonization, which is enclosing a living system, i.e. the dome, and controlling the ethers. And part of that controlling the ethers, of course, was also controlling the electromagnetism within the ethers. So he said a lot here. All right, let's go on. The transformation of matter. In the 19th century, scientists Michael Faraday, James Clark Maxwell, and Henrik Heinz, or Hertz. Oh, I wonder if that's how they name Hertz, Hertz. Well, let me just keep reading, Rhonda, keep reading. And Henrik Hertz formulated a theory that described electromagnetic phenomena. This theory indicated that electric and magnetic forces resulted from the effect of electric and magnetic fields existing in space between electric charges. Okay, so let me pause because I don't want to confuse the folks. Sorry, when I was describing this and I was describing the environment of what we're calling planet Earth and what they're calling the universe, bear with me. Let me bring it up. This is why I don't want to get rid of that. When I was talking about the electromagnetic coil, 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 coil. Okay, um, all right, here we go. Sorry about that, fam. Had to literally go put together an album in order to, um, a picture album in order to show you. So when I, uh, real quick, was reading over this part about the ether uh, based on what Tesla was saying, um, being by being set in motion, this fluid, the ether, if you can control that, you can control everything. And he went into the, the sun, um, the stars, 
light, etc. And I said uh, this goes directly into uh, this being an enclosed system with a dome and what the sun is, etc., etc. So those that rock with me, you've already been over this. I know I bring it up a lot. These are for the folks that don't rock with us on Thursday. Uh, you just uh, listen to the podcast. I want to explain what I meant that what Tesla is saying about the movement in this fluid and the ether is extremely, extremely important. And that is also why I showed you density, not only to show you that the concept of gravi gravity that they're telling us is not accurate, but also the importance of the fluid I'm using quotation marks, or the water and the density associated with that water, how important it is, okay? So that was the purpose of me showing you density, not only about gravity, but also about the associated fluid or water in the atmosphere, okay? And how uh, that density and how the ether, if you know how to control the ether, you know how to control everything, all right? Because this is an enclosed system, all right? So let's hit it. Okay, so those of you are, that are into the esoteric uh, or even um, astrology, you all know that this is uh, this little part with the spokes, this circle represents what they're calling the black sun, okay? Now, most people know that the black sun, uh, they're saying is underneath earth and coming from the black sun is uh, a, a tree of life, Mount Maru, or Mount Maru, Mount Maru, okay? you That's what you'll hear in the esoteric world, okay? Um... But what this is really showing you is the black sun is really an electromagnetic coil. This electromagnetic coil controls this enclosed system, all right? So, and also check out the lost history of flat earth, um, Iranon really did some um a great drop as you can see it's 5 hours so even if you have to do do it over a 2 week time period i am telling you you will not regret it you will not regret it at all excellent excellent work all right so this is what this is showing you so even that ss symbol that was representing a spoke off of the electromagnetic coil or what they're calling the black sun, okay? Those in the secret societies, they worship the electromagnetic sun or the electromagnetic coil. You'll hear folks say it's the worshiping of uh, the black sun. Now, whether or not those in the secret society know that, I highly doubt it. It probably depends on what level you're at. Okay. So this whole concept of a circle within a circle, 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 it's the closest you are to the core of the circle, the more high up you are in the food chain, okay? So I just wanted to give you all that concept as well. So as the uh, electromagnetic coil turns, that energy from that electromagnetic uh, coil or black sun 
is controlling the ethers, which also controls the seasons on the planet, the sun, what we're calling the movement of the sun, and the movement of the moon. So even the concept of time itself, which this is represented in the zodiac sign, all of it is controlled in a enclosed system, okay? Because this zodiac wheel represents the procession of the equinox, which the beginning of a total cycle around this starts with the zodiac Aries. Okay, so each age and each one of these zodiacs represents an age, which is uh, 3,600 years per age. And is, it is associated with a certain frequency ether. All right, so uh, all the mythology that you hear about, about uh, the god Aries and all of this jazz and you hear about in the Bible, the um, the bull and all of that, they're telling you which ages. Like uh, Jesus is represented as the fish, which is the Pisces age. Okay, it's telling you all of these things. Okay, um, if you are into the book of Enoch, whoo, I, watching this Eronon, I remembered in the book of Enoch when he was uh, talking about the procession of the sun and the moon, and he was talking about going through the gates. This is what Enoch was talking about, okay? How the sun and the moon the reflection, the reflection or reflect, refracted light of the sun and moon are really just the spokes or the turns of this electromagnetic coil that they're calling a black sun. All right, so I know I said a lot. And I know those of you that have heard this from me a bunch of times, I told y'all, I apologized up in advance. <laughs> I say that because... I want you all to understand this. Hey, that's why I keep putting it before you because I know it's a lot. Trust me, I understand. It's a lot. That's why I keep going over it. Okay, so this is just representing that black sun underneath the electromagnetic coil. Okay, the black sun. This is the known realm I'm sorry this is the realm this is the realm this is the known world okay notice the electromagnetic coil I'll keep going I, I'll, I'll let it explain itself this is the the dome okay now, I also highly recommend, if you all have not watched a uh, series called Under the Dome, uh, you can get it for free on, um, I'm not sure if it's Peacock, but it's the other free one. You could get it free on one of those apps. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. They talk about a lot, okay? I, I finally finished up the season over the weekend, um, all of the series over the weekend. It took me uh, quite some time, took me a few weeks to do so because I was mainly looking at it from the, the scientific perspective, not all of that love scene mess. So be patient with it, but pay attention, okay? Because it goes over all the stuff regarding the dome and in that third season honey they even got deep talking about underground structures the crystals in the underground structures and i won't spoil it 
for you all, but I'll give a hint because I know some folk are watching it. They even get into how reincarnation happens. I'm not going to blow it for you all. I'm going to give you about two months to get through it. And I'm, I want to see who caught where they talk about specifically how reincarnation happens how it happens, it's going to blow your, your wig back, all right? But under the dome, it's pretty much giving you the play of living in an enclosed system, all right? So uh, check it out. Um, dang, I can't remember the other free app. I don't think it's Peacock. It's another one. Uh. So you can get it for free or you can uh, buy each season. But it's, I highly, highly recommend it. All right, so let's go. So here's the electromagnetic coil, dome, realm, known world. Okay. Notice the electromagnetic coil or black sun emitting the light or the electromagnetism, okay? That's the electromagnetism. And notice they notated the ionosphere. Let's continue. So when Tesla was talking about if you can control if you can control the ethers, so all of that, the ethers, and even if you want to put the ethers all the way out here, if you can control the ethers, you can control the distance of the sun, the seasons, etc. So what they're showing you here is that electromagnetic coil, the magnetism, the electromagnetism from that coil is creating reflect, refracted light, which creates the sun and creates the moon. So when folks are talking about the sun is la, 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 millions of miles away. Oh, okay, then. All right. Now, I know for those of you that don't believe any of this, hey, you have every right to, that's your business, okay? And for those of you that I have gone over this with before, just be patient, be patient, okay? So let's continue. So, oh, what I wanted to say is, so the electromagnetic field hitting off of the top of the dome creating this ref refracted light representing the sun and the moon. Okay, so this is the layer of the ionosphere, the different gases. Okay, so as you can see here, the sun forms at the helium gas level and neon. The moon forms at the krypton. Argon is where the plasma sky, uh, plasma sky, plasma sky forms. Okay, now those of you that read the book of Enoch, and Enoch was talking about, he was going up into uh, the heavens and the different gates of heaven. This is what he was describing, family. He was going up into the ionosphere. And so when he talked about um, seeing the sun and all of that jazz, this is what he's talking about. And when he was talking about um, being able to see the gates that the sun go through, if you're all the way up here in the ionis, uh, ionosphere you, and you can see down to that black sun, 
And you can see the movement, the true movement of the sun and the moon and as it passes, as the uh, electromagnetic energy is swirling from the electromagnetic coil, that's what he was able to see. But he was describing it as going through gates, just like he was describing going through the heavens. Okay? He was describing the ionosphere. Let's keep it moving. Okay, so this is the concept of um, the ethers is electromagnetic charge with positive and negative. Okay. All right, and then this one just uh, kind of goes over um, the different layers. Okay, stratosphere, giving you the altitudes, and then all the way up to the ionosphere. Okay, and shout out to uh, the YouTube channel, Vibes of Cosmo. I think I snapped this uh, from one of his vids. So check out Vibes of Cosmo. Uh, he also gives you the breakdown of... Um, all of this information as well, and he puts it in really short vids, okay? As a matter of fact, that Irwan video, when it starts talking about uh, the ethers and all of that stuff and what the moon really is, he got that information from Vibes of Co Cosmo, which is uh, a guy out of Russia, Sturgis. That's where he got the information from. All right, because even the concept of the moon will straight blow your wig back, all the way back. <laughs> okay, all right, so again, just reminding people, y'all remember them classes that we were supposed to be paying attention <laughs> in middle school and high school? But I mean, I, I would have been a lot more interested if they would have taught it the way we breaking this down, as I'm sure everybody else would have been interested. Okay, so remember the sun forms at the um, at the ionosphere level, the helium and neon, and at uh, the moon forms at the krypton level. But remember, they're just refracted light from that electromagnet. Okay, right. So this is just showing the different gases. All right. I think that's it. Okay, so let's get back. All right, so sorry I had to do that, but I wanted you all to understand how powerful of what Tesla is saying. And I didn't even get into the the stars and what they're calling planets. Uh, you know, I'll throw a separate video in this series to talk about that. I'll split that out, okay? All right. Okay. Um, in the 19th century, scientists, I think we went over this, but just forgive me. The scientists, uh, Michael Faraday, James Clark Maxwell, and Hen uh, Henrik Hertz formulated a theory that described electromagnetic phenomena. We did. We did go over this, but I'm going to re-go over it since I had to stop and show you the importance of that electromagnetic coil. This theory indicated that electric and magnetic forces resulted from the effect of the electric and magnetic fields existing in space between electric charges, okay? So I showed you all in that particular um, pic where in the enclosed system, that electric, uh, electromagnetic coil is setting the ether environment for uh, what level of magnetic magnetism the uh, planet is on, or as people like to say, frequency. 
These electric charges were produced by ether, which was thought to be, uh, I'm sorry, which was thought to be able to exert electric forces on ordinary matter. Hertz showed that moving electromagnetic fields could break away from ordinary matter and propagate through the ether as independent electromagnetic waves carrying energy. These electromagnetic waves came in both visible and invisible forms. Hertz showed that visible light is one visible form of electromagnetic wave. Invisible electromagnetic waves include radio waves, X-rays, and microwaves. The concept of such waves moving through the ether can be likened to the waves that spread over a pond after a stone is thrown in the water. The ripples in the pond can be thought of as the equivalent of electromagnetic waves and the steel water as the equivalent of the ether. In a pond, the force of the stone hitting the water results in the ripples. One of the things puzzling the scientists of Einstein's time was the uh, time was was what exactly caused the formation of electromagnetic fields whose independent movement resulted in electromagnetic waves, which they conceived as moving through space. Okay, All right now again, uh, when they're talking about space, they are talking about, remember, because if you go by the, the ball theory that Earth is a round ball, spinning, child, I didn't forget how many uh, miles an hour they claim that is spinning um, and in this open space. Uh, they would have to explain how electromagnetic field is working versus Earth being not a spinning ball, but a uh, flat disk with a dome over it. So what you basically have is an enclosed system and electromagnetism, of course, or uh, the ethers is within that system. Okay. The Michael um, Moreland experiment was published in 1887 by Albert A. Um, and Edward and performed at what is now Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. All right, then. It compared the speed of light in perpendicular directions in an attempt to detect the relative motion of matter through the stationary luminiferous ether, ether wind. The negative results are generally considered to be the first strong evidence against the then prevalent ether theory and initiated a line of research that eventually led to special relativity in which the stationary ether concept has no role. The experiment has been referred to as the moving off point for the theoretical aspect of the second scientific revolution. Oh boy. So on the book Universe and Dr. Einstein by Lincoln Barnett in 1949, page 38, it can be read. Okay. So, and just again, I'm going over this to explain for us to ra rather explore the theory of gravity, because gravity is a theory. Density, ether, electromagnetism, okay? I'm going over this to show that all of these things now that they are coming out with as far as new technology, 
that are going to use electromagnetism. None of that's new technology, family. It's just technology that was hidden, okay, in the old world. So what I am proposing, and apparently um, Jim Dufree, is that all of the old technology from the old world was hidden. And around the late 1800s, they started bringing out the possibility of that old world technology, using it, but then they also introduce other concepts. Um, and they did that because they were not ready to bring forth what the old world was using, which was clean technology, free energy technology that was much less damaging to the planet. So someone is making the decision on what technology the world will use. Okay. All right. So let's see what uh, this universe and Dr. Einstein uh, book excerpt is saying. Among those who pondered the enigma of um, Michelin sign and Morley experiment was a young patent office examiner in Bern named Albert Einstein. Hmm. In 1905, when he was just 26 years old, he published a short paper suggesting an answer to the riddle in terms that the open up, that opened up a new world of physical thought. He began by rejecting the ether theory. So why did he reject the ether theory? So this goes back to what I said in uh, previous episodes in this series where we kept seeing a reoccurring theme over and over again where they had these scientists who were doing the polar opposite. So on the one hand, you had Nikola Tesla and um, his crew, that it was all about vibration, frequency, electromagnetic energy, and ether. And then you had the other um, folks, or you want to say the direct current folks and the alternative current folks, so the uh, Einsteins, the um, Edison folk who had a totally different theory and their theories won the day. And what I am saying is that both sets of group were taught two different sets of sciences purposely Okay, they were purposely taught those things. And specifically, Tesla did not come up with all of these things they're saying he did. He was taught them. I believe he was given, at a minimum, blueprints of old world technology. And maybe even he had old prototypes to reverse engineer them. Okay. So Einstein, he began by rejecting the ether theory and with it, the whole idea of space as a fixed system or framework. Y'all seeing this? Absolute at rest. Within which is possible to distinguish absolute from relative motion. So if he, do you all understand what... Uh, what he's saying or what they put to rest. Because if you say that space is a fixed system or a framework and it's at absolute rest, that would kill the uh, earth spinning however many miles a minute they say it is. That would totally, totally kill that within which it is possible to distinguish absolute from relative motion. The one indisputable fact established by the uh, Michelson, 
I don't know why I want to call it Michelin, Michelson Moreland experiment was that the velocity of light in unaffected by the motion of the earth. Einstein seized on this as a revelation of universal law. If the velocity of light is constant regardless of the earth's motion, he reasoned it must be constant regardless of motion of any sun, moon, stars, meteor, or any other system moving anywhere in the universe. From this, he drew a broader generalization and asserted that the law of nature are the same for all uniformly moving systems. This simple statement is the essence of Einstein's special theory of relativity. It incorporates the Galilean relativity principle, which states that mechanical laws are the same for all uniformly moving systems. But its phrasing is more comprehensive, for Einstein was thinking not only of mechanical laws, laws, but the laws of governing light and other electromagnetic phenomena. So he lumped them together in one fundamental postulate. All the phenomena of nature, all the law of nature are the same for all systems that move uniformly relative to one another. All right, y'all. Let's hit it. The ether was thought to be a backdrop at the state at a state of absolute rest against which the movement of elements of the cosmos occurred. In his article in 1905, Einstein didn't really fully reject the existence of ether, he only suggested a mathematical treatment of some relativistic problems. In 1920, after he developed the general relativity, he arrived to the conclusion that ether should exist. This fact is enormous, is of enormous importance when citing the contributions of Albert Einstein. The Einstein statement from 1920 is missing. It's showing the heck is, baby. It's missing. In the scholar physics textbooks, where only his articles from 1905 are mentioned, Ether and Relativity by Einstein in 1920. The ether of the general theory of relativity is a medium which is itself devoid of all mechanical and chemical qualities, but helps to determine mechanical and electromagnetic events. Yeah, I don't remember them. Um, they don't be saying that that's what this man done set up there and said. Okay, so obviously Einstein knew there was an ether and he also knew about the electromagnetic field and then he pretty much had to say that they all, they both work together and when you bring movement into the mix, that's when the mechanical of the movement comes into play. That was a more roundabout way of saying it than what Tesla said, which Tesla was basically like, you cannot have curvature unless there is some object there to interact to make it curvature. Tesla put it more simply. To deny ether is ultimately to assume that empty space has no physical quality whatsoever. The fundamental facts of quantum mechanics do not harmonize with this view. Hmm. Okay. So this just real quick that, um, and shout out again to Jim Dufree. Uh, this is the website, teslaresearch.jimdufree.com. We're on the dynamic theory of gravity. 
right? So let's go real quick on this video that he embedded in here. Einstein 1920, does ether exist? Although skeptics often point to Einstein's theory of relativity, it was Einstein who in 1920 said, There are weighty arguments to be adduced in favor of the ether hypothesis. To deny the ether is ultimately to assume that empty space has no physical qualities whatsoever. The fundamental facts of mechanics do not harmonize with this view. According to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> Ether and the Theory of Relativity by uh, Einstein. This was uh, out of London in 1922. Now, I want y'all to notice the dates when all this stuff is shaken down. So, you had Tesla and them in the late 1800s, Tesla, Einstein, and Westinghouse. Um, now, you got uh, Einstein in the early 1900s. Now, some say in the mud flood community, and I, I am tending to agree with them, that something happened. Something happened in the 1800s where a lot of, if, if you want to say missing time, uh, let's say missing events to be fair. Something happened, some missing event where technology went away, okay? The mud flood community would call those resets, okay? Which resets are starting to make more and more sense to me because if the ethers are being controlled in an enclosed system, by an electromagnetic coil or electromagnetism, yeah, I can see resets being very, very easily to accomplish. All right. How does it come about that alongside of the idea of ponderable matter, which is derived by extraction from everyday life, the physicist set to set the idea of existence of another kind of matter, the ether. The explanation is probably to be sought in those phenomena which have been have given rise to the theory of action at a distance and in the properties of light which have led to undulatory theory. And see, once they be throwing all these damn theories and naming them all of this stuff. This is why people don't be interested in science. When they can keep this stuff simple. Ether, electromagnetism, slash frequency, density. Electromagnetism, frequency, light the spectrums of light. They could keep this stuff so much more simple. Okay? Recap, uh, recapulating, we may say that according to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. Ether exists, dude. Dang, all of this other stuff. According to the general theory of relativity space, without ether is unthinkable. For in such space, there not only would be no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existing for standards of space and time, measuring rods and clocks, nor therefore any space-time intervals in the physical sense. But this ether may not be thought of as endowed with the quality characteristics of ponderable media as consisting of parts which may be tracked through time. 
The idea of motion may not be applied to it. All right, so let's see how he breaks that down. In 1920, Einstein said about ether corresponding with classical ether, but in his paper in 1924 uh, named Concerning the Ether, Einstein explained the ether of general relativity is not absolute because matter is influenced by the ether, just as matter influences the structure of ether. So the only similarity of this relative, relativistic ether concept with the classical ether models lies in the presence of physical properties in space. Therefore, Einstein used the word ether, found little support in the scientific community, and played no role in the continuing development of modern physics. Okay, so again... I am saying, in my opinion, he was shut down with talking about ether because whoever uh, is controlling what technology will be brought forth to the world, um, even from what knowledge would be brought forth to the world, said, no, nah, uh-uh. We don't want y'all to talk about ether. We don't want you to talk about electromagnetism. Uh, no, that's a no. So that's why the scientific community does not promote Einstein talking about ether and the importance of ether, just like they did not bring forth the work of Tesla. An understanding of the ether is also important for understanding the theory of electromagnetic phenomenon which precedes Einstein's theory of relativity. So let's be clear. Electromagnetic phenomenon precedes Einstein theory of relativity. Other words, old world knowledge, old world technology, precedes Einstein theory of relativity. So when you talk to folks about um, e an electromagnetic universe, frequency, gravity, density, and they're like, oh, you don't know what the beep you're talking about. And no matter how wokey woke, 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 woke they are, because... They're basing it on Einstein's theory of relativity. And the sad part about it is even Einstein knew that ether was a major driver. But let's continue. Gravitational waves. In modern physics, gravitational waves are supposed to be ripples in the curvature of space time from a heavy moving object which propagates its waves traveling outward from the source that radiate at the speed of light or in other words the spinning ball predicted in 1916 by albert einstein to exist on the basis of his theories of general relativity gravitational waves theoretically transport energy as gravitational radiation Sources of detectable gravitational waves could possibly include binary star systems composed of white dwarfs, neutron stars, or black holes. These, gravitational, these gravity waves behave in similar ways to many other types of waves. Tesla moved, Tesla's greatest inventions were all based on the study of waves. Absolutely. So when y'all hear folk talk about Tesla and the concept of three, six, nine, and I think it was uh, folks often quote a quote from Tesla saying, if only people knew the importance of three, six, nine, that three, six, nine is describing the wave, the electromagnetic wave. Right? So, 
Okay, the wave that you can get from the what? The ether. All right. Um, Tesla's greatest inventions were all based on the study of waves. He also considered sound, light. And remember, sound is frequency. Light is frequency also. Electromagnetic wave frequency. Heat, x-ray, and radio waves to be related phenomenon that could be studied using the same sort of maths. For this reason, there exists the possibility that Tesla had extended this thinking to gravity. Thermodynamics. In physics, the law of conservation of energy states that the total energy of an isolated system re remains constant. It is said to be conserved over time. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Rather, it transforms from one form to another. For instance, chemical energy can be converted to kinetic energy in the explosion of a stick of dynamite. A consequence of the law of uh, conservation of energy is that a perpetual motion machine of the first kind cannot exist. That is to say, no system without an external energy supply can deliver an unlimited amount of energy to its surroundings. Okay? All right. So it's saying, in other words, you need uh, some sort of machine to generate energy. There is no more energy in matter than that received from the environment. Okay, so the following list is a selection of quotes to gather information which could be related to Tesla's dynamic energy. Oh, okay, well, I can't wait till you get to that. Okay, um, let's go down, I'm trying to see how far I want to go. Ah, uh, and how far we can understand the world around us is the ultimate thought of every student of nature. The coarseness of our senses prevents us from recognizing the ulterior um, construction of matter and astronomy, the uh, grandest, the most positive of natural sciences, can only teach us something that happens, as it were, in our immediate neighborhood of the remoter portions where the boundary, the boundless universe with its numberless stars and suns we know of. But far beyond the limit of perception of our senses, the spirit can still guide us. And so we may hope that even these unknown worlds, infinite, small, and great, may in measure become known to us. Still, even this knowledge should reach us. The searching minds will find a barrier, perhaps forever unsurpassable, to true recognition of that which seems to be the mere appearance of which is the only and slender basis of all philosophy. Okay, well, whatever. Um, let's go to this one. I'm trying to pick out, uh, family, which ones that'll make sense. Let's see. Mr. Tesla's vision, how the electrician's lamps, lamp of a Latin may construct new worlds. According to adoptive theory, every ponderable atom is differentiated from a tenuous, fragile, vague fluid, filling all space merely by spinning motion as a whirl of water in a calm lake. By being set in movement, this fluid, the ether, Okay, remember, the fluid, the ether, becomes gross matter. By being set in motion, this fluid, the ether, becomes gross matter. Its movement arrested, halted. The primary substance reverts to its normal state. It appears impossible for a man through harness energy of the medium and suitable agencies for starting and stopping ether worlds to cause matter to form and disappear. 
at his command, almost without effort on his part, old worlds would vanish and new ones would spring into being. He could alter the size of the planet, control its seasons, adjust its distance from the sun, guide it on its eternal journey along any path he might choose through the depths of the universe. Okay, so this is just going by that uh, quote that I um, went over earlier, which I was s telling you all that he's saying pretty much that those that know how to control and manipulate the ether can control everything, right? And I went into the black sun and all of that jazz, okay? So I think I'm going to stop here. Um, and then I'm going to go back through this, uh, to see how I'm going to pick up for the next, uh, portion of the series. Cause the next one, I already know where I want to go, but before I do that, I did want to share this with the family because when we talk about electro, uh, magnetism and we talk about, uh, levitation, I want to get into levitation. Okay, this is family, a part of old world technology that they are not telling you about. Okay, so this particular uh, video is about, about hydrodynamic levitation. Okay, and here's the YouTube channel, Vertiasum. So let's just real quick, I'm just going to play a quick snippet so you all can see. Just real quick. Check this out. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? That is hydrodynamic levitation. Check it out. This styrofoam ball is levitating on this stream of water and it's doing so in a very stable way. The setup is so stable you can play frisbee through it. Which is weird to me because the water is off to one side of the ball and that doesn't seem to make any sense. You can block the water for a second and the ball will still levitate. Have a look. Isn't that cool? How can it be stable like this? How can this be a stable configuration? That is what we're gonna explain. This is my friend Blake. He is a toy inventor and he actually came up with this and he brought it to me and I was like, that is awesome. There's some really cool physics going on here. Juggling with water. I can't believe it will just allow you to switch balls like that. They can even hit each other yeah, as they go they down. Hit each other and it doesn't take the other one off the stream. So how does this effect work? Well. A lot of people might think of the hairdryer ping pong ball effect, which works basically based on Bernoulli's principle. That's actually what we're showing here. We've brought this stream down so it's going at a very low velocity. So it's pretty much laminar flow. And what you can see if you look at the ball is it's entirely enclosed in water. So that water stream comes up, goes around the ball, and just as with the ping pong ball, if it moves to one side of the stream, it slows down the flow of fluid. And according to Bernoulli's principle, this increases the pressure relative to the faster flowing fluid on the other side. So it pushes the ball back into the middle. That is what provides the stability for this ball. But I think what we're seeing with the bigger balls is uh, something different. This is the largest styrofoam ball I could find, so I don't expect it to work, but hey, we're gonna give it a shot. Should I go higher? Oh! It's happening! <laughs> Massive size! <laughs> that is incredible! Look at that dance on there, man! It's like got this instability, but it corrects! It's incredible! <laughs> you should see the way the water is spiraling off there. That is awesome! So I've been thinking a lot about the physics that makes this possible. What I think is happening is 
as the stream contacts the ball, it pushes it up, but it also pushes the ball out, away from the stream. So what I think is remarkable is that the ball actually will stay there. It, it is in a stable configuration. And from looking at the high speed footage, what I really think is going on is this water is getting thrown over and down by the ball. And since the ball is putting a force over and down on the water, that water is putting a force up and in on the ball, which keeps it right in that stream. It's because there's a bit of adhesion between the water here and the styrofoam. It starts to go a little slower. That pulls all that water over the ball. And that's the start of how you get the ball to spin and how you get that spray down on the right hand side, which provides more lift and keeps forcing the ball back into the stream. So oh, come on. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna play that entire thing. I just wanted you all to see that is a hydrodynamic levitation. Uh, so thank you to uh, this particular YouTube channel. Uh, come on, move out the way. Uh, Veritasium, Veritasium. And I think that's one element on the periodic tables, VE. Okay, you could tell I didn't pay attention in uh, physics class, whatever. Because they should have been teaching it like this. I would have paid attention, doggone it. So um, <laughs> this that's another great experiment for the babies. I think that's a great experiment for the babies. But the point of me showing this is to show you levitation with water. Let's go on to another one. Okay, so in this one, this is from the same... Um, YouTube channel, uh, how many people saw that levitation? Okay, they got a lot of uh, subscribers too, but about 2 million people saw the water levitation. So let's get to this one now. This is electromagnet levitation. Now check this out, fam. Quadcopter. All right. So I'm, I'm not going to play all of this. I just want y'all to get a, a gist of it. If you spin these fast, let me see. How much does this thing weigh? Well, try and pick it up. Okay. <laughs> which is, which okay. is. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Be nice to it. 105 pounds. 105 pounds. It consists of four motors connected up to these spinning magnet arrays. And if you spin these fast enough, it will actually levitate? That's correct. <laughs> Let's see if it can do it. Are you ready? Let's fire it up. It's lifting. Okay, it's flying now. Is it? Yeah, that's right. Oh. Now it is so easy to just move around. That's amazing. Give it a push, like it's got some real... Wow. It can carry some weight, hey? Yeah. That is amazing. So how does it work? Well, it's similar to how a magnet falling through a pipe is slowed down. Anytime a conductor experiences a changing magnetic field, electric currents are induced in it which create a magnetic field to oppose that change. And in this case, the spinning magnets induce currents in the copper sheet. They create a magnetic field which is nearly a mirror image of the spinning magnets, and so they're repelled. If the rotors spin fast enough, this repulsion leads to levitation. That is awesome. Alright, let's start again. Yep. So it's just going to come gently land. The induced currents then encounter resistance in the copper, so they dissipate their energy as heat. Whoa. <laughs> and this copper is... Okay, so uh, y'all see that copper underneath it, and remember, co copper is an excellent conductor of energy. So a lot of those old world buildings, when you see the antennas on top of the buildings, and you see the copper on the buildings, the mud flood community said that those were used as... Um, catching energy out of the ethers, out of the ethers, or catching that electromagnetic wave to, uh, to conduct energy, all right? So I just wanted to point that out, that 
the copper is used as a conductor for the magnetism or the magnets spin different certain directions at a certain velocity to create the levitation is pretty hot it's gotten warmer yeah i can still keep my hand on it at least yeah for a second or two but it is like uh like a hot mug of coffee or something yeah i experienced this before with another electromagnetic levitation device except with this one the changing magnetic field was created by an electromagnet in the base inducing currents in a light aluminum plate which levitated whoa <laughs> The plate got so hot, you could boil water on it. Check out how hot this plate is. If you have two north magnets facing each other, yeah. they normally just kind of like fall off. Yeah. Is there a similar problem here or no? Uh, not really, no. Uh, and the reason is the magnetic fields that are induced by currents in the copper sheet are a mirror image of the applied magnetic field. Um, and the effect is so quick that, that as, it, as it moves, it, it just kind of follows it around. Making this device work in practice is harder than it looks. For one thing, the magnetic field of the permanent magnets has to be very strong. Neodymium magnets are strong, but there's a special configuration you can use to make them even stronger. It's called a Halbach array. They're used in particle accelerators, they're used in um, fridge magnets actually, a Halbach array, so they're stronger on the side that sticks to the fridge. So just real quick, when he talked about that um, particle accelerator, um, that kind of reminds me of that, um, that CERN crap, okay? And many were saying they were using CERN to try to, uh, CERN to try to open up a portal. So now are you all understanding? So they were using CERN, which is really, they saying a particle spinner, um, reacting, with the natural ether, with the natural ether, or the electromagnetism to try to open up a portal. All right. Fridge, so huh. use less material overall. Magnetic field lines run from north to south, and they're normally symmetric on both sides of a magnet. But if you rearrange them like this, the magnetic field lines are channeled almost entirely into one side of the magnetic array, and they cancel out on the other side. This configuration produces a much stronger magnetic field without changing the properties of the magnets. In these rotors, there are 12 wedge-shaped magnets. Their magnetic poles are fixed in this particular arrangement. This increases the magnetic field on the bottom side and almost eliminates it on the top. As the magnets spin, they create a rotating magnetic field in the copper beneath them. This induces currents that create magnetic fields, which oppose the magnetic field of the spinning magnets above. The result is a repulsive force that is effectively lift for this quadcopter. But in addition to lift, there is also drag. Energy is clearly being dissipated in the system as the heat produced by the induced currents in the copper. And that energy comes from the fact the magnetic field of the induced currents is not a perfect mirror of the spinning magnets above. Instead, the induced magnetic poles are slightly ahead. So they produce a backward force on the rotors, which is really a backwards torque. And that's why the rotors on alternate corners have to spin in opposite directions, because otherwise they would produce a net spin and turn the whole machine in one direction. This way, they cancel out. This principle has been used to achieve levitation in everything from maglev trains to hoverboards. And it's being considered as a means to make the Hyperloop, a super fast system for transporting people and goods through tubes at very low pressure. And just to uh, refresh people' me uh, memory, in the Black Panther movie, when they were showing you that uh, floating train that was um, underground, which was really in an ancient tree, um, and they were saying they were using vibram vibranium, I think that was the name of the little um, thingy, but they were really showing you also, they, they were not really, they were, they were showing you the uh, electromagnetism and le levitation, okay? But instead of spinning the magnets, the vehicle's motion itself would cause the magnetic field to change in the conductive track below. So in the future, do you think this is going to be how we travel? I think like ongoing developments in digital motor controllers and uh, very powerful magnets will mean that uh, talking about moving humans and cargo at extremely high speeds uh, is actually something that we can 
as a species kind of look at and be like, wow, it turns out that getting from one city to another city in the same day is something that the next billion or two billion people might have the opportunity to do in one lifetime. Hey. Okay, so, uh, oh, let me see how they pronounce because I'm butchering these people's stuff. Veritasium is supported by viewers like you on Patreon and by Audible. Audible. All right, so Vertasium, okay, and that's one of the elements on the periodic table, so y'all can tell I was far from paying attention. <laughs> so thank you for Vertasium. I'm going to check y'all out on Patreon because they got some great stuff on uh, their YouTube channel. Okay, so yeah, I'm really interested. So I want to share one more a video with the family. Um, I think this dude uh, got his... Um, information from the other YouTube channel, Vertasium. Uh, but this is John Irwasco. And this is anti-gravity methods, um, electromagnetic field, DC pulse, AC, LF, and HF. All right, so let's see what dude is talking about. I had to fast forward because, honey, y'all really wouldn't have I, I, we really couldn't hear the first part, uh, but if you're interested in this video at the beginning, he's going to break down um, the actual prototype of what he's showing you here. I couldn't hear what he was saying, so I wasn't going to waste the family's time. But if you want those details, he does give it here. Well, he's not giving it. He's showing it from somebody else's video, and I don't know what that source is. So here we go current of 44 kilohertz of 105 watts commonly available as an electronic low voltage lighting transformer. A conductor can be levitated above an electromagnet with low frequency alternating currents just as well with an air core pancake coil with higher frequencies. This method achieves a very stable but undamped equilibrium without any need for feedback control such as metal 10. The copper coil was energized with 240 volt 50 Hz AC mains power which provides sufficient amplitude and by adjusting the voltage amplitude, levitation height can also be adjusted. We can also use high frequency excitation where the incident magnetic field is shielded from passing through the plate. This is due to large induced circulating currents in the plate. In this case, the flux lines are compressed beneath the coil. The resultant induced currents may be used to generate a lift force as in a maglev or may be used to heat the conducting plate as induction heating. A simple calculation can determine the minimum plate thickness at a given operating frequency to reach the high frequency limit. Using Fleming's left hand rule for electric motors shows the direction of the thrust on the conductor carrying a current in the magnetic field. Therefore, different geometries of cores can be used to levitate different geometries of metal objects. The one shown is a common induction motor commonly found in fans and old record players that had the top half of its laminations cut off. This low energy device just levitates and rotates an aluminium cylinder. Greater electrical power and additional phases with corresponding conductor geometries achieve far more stable levitation at increased heights. In the case of low frequency excitation where the operating frequency is sufficiently low, the induced magnetic field due to induced currents is small compared to the incident field. The magnetic field of a pair of identical cores with the axes along a vertical line are separated by a distance comparable to their diameter. When the currents in the coils flow in opposite directions, a cusp-shaped field is produced in which the magnetic field is zero at the center point between the coils. This magnetic field is capable of supporting stably and centrally an aluminium cylinder executing remarkable gyrations and oscillations if set into motion. Higher frequencies in the RF band can also be used with a pair of cores, oppositely wound as in a previous method. With sufficient power from 1 kilowatts, this technique will even suspend small quantities of electrically conducted material and even melt the material by induction heating. fam so i just wanted to show you again um wow dang all right we talked about that but you can see this is another video you can check out um but i wanted to uh just go over the fam uh, go over this with the fam 
to just show you how um, the concept of magnetism, number one, it's not new. And then number two, folks are experimenting with it and they are literally creating not only energy from ether using frequency slash electromagnetism, but you can also recreate levitation, okay? Right, so the concepts that they have taught the world on gravity um, are not accurate. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to the family again. Thank you to the YouTube site, Jim Do Free. You can get this information from uh, Tesla Research Research.jimdofree.com. I'm gonna put the link in the description. Uh, this was based on the dynamic theory. <laughs>